somehow got an interview on a Saturday and I met with some of the senior team members there and I flat out said to them, this is where I want to be. I will work for you for a month to prove my value. No cost, no commitment. I want to prove myself. And they said, we've never done this, but you're hired. Cannibal Mindset, and today I'm sitting with, you know, one of these badass women that you meet that you're just like, man, I gotta get more, I gotta get more of this. So I'm sitting with Molly Alkman, president, owner, um, CEO, I don't know how many titles she has, of Group 2 Advertising. And if you don't know who Group 2 Advertising is, you absolutely know their work. Uh, in the home building segment, you guys are, you're it. I'm saying that's Thank like, you. you're, there's you, and then there's everybody else. And what's crazy is you are in you are young, but your company's been around for 50 years, celebrating your 50th anniversary this year. Uh, started by your father, uh, you took it over, which I want to really get into that because I think that's a, a great story. Uh, but sitting with Molly Alkman, uh, welcome. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate. You. I'm in Philadelphia, which is awesome because I'm from you know, not from. Spent many years in Philadelphia and. You had like the best location. You're like it's right on good. JFK <laughs> Boulevard. It's like, I'm like, I'm coming here today. I'm like, is she really on JFK Boulevard? This is like prime real estate in Philadelphia. This is the place to be. So before we get started, the most important question, I just want to get out of the way first is, what is the go-to lunch spot right here? Because you are, you're like three blocks from Jake's Pizza. You're <laughs> five blocks from Reading Terminal. You're like right near Shake. Like, where's the where's the? I'm a little bit embarrassed to tell you this, but I eat the same lunch every single day, and I go to Sweet Green, which is a block away, and I order the same salad every what? day. What? What know. is what is what is the what is the salad? It's really good. So it has chicken, almonds, uh, sweet potato, a couple other things, lentils, corn. It's but there's a lot of really good. Food here in it's Philly. Just, it is the number one city yeah. in the country for restaurants every year for yes. like the last so twenty years. We're gonna go take a tour today. I think I just learned like I though I thought the interview was gonna go one way, but because of your answer, the interview is going a whole oh, different, no. <laughs> different, <laughs> different way. They <laughs> eat the same thing for lunch. I know. Day. I'm like a total creature of habit, so I like to stay in a routine. What? So how does that? How does that? that routine if not just the lunch thing but how does that affect affect other areas of your life so it affects every area of my life um i am a business owner but i'm also a mom so you know having those routine makes it so that i can focus my decisions really on work and where i need to make decisions and then the areas where i don't need to make decisions i try not to um so i do tend to like I'll eat the same thing every day for months and then yeah. never eat that food again. Yeah, that's <laughs> um, so, great. so it's the way I dress, the way I plan my day. Um, now it doesn't mean I'm not spontaneous yeah. when it comes to family time or vacation time or things like that. But um, for the most part, I have a, a solid routine. We leave our house every morning at eight o'clock in the morning. Exactly. That's so great. Um, my husband and I walk our son to school, stroller with the little one, and then we drop her, and then we come to work together. That's fantastic. It's There's a. Cool. <laughs> I just finished uh, reading a book and doing a talk on that very thing. This decision fatigue. Yeah. And this part of your brain called the cingulate gyrus cortex. You remember that? We wow. just did that single gyrus cortex, and the C-shaped part behind your ear, and it makes all of your decisions. And they talk about why, how you should um, limit your decision making because you literally get decision fatigue. And to do to wear the same type of clothes every day, or that. capsule wardrobes, capsule diets, yeah. the same type of things. I do the exact that exact thing, and it's you know we're in a creative industry here. So at Group Two, a lot of the people who work here are really into fashion. And I kind of get teased because I am not into fashion at all. Like I wear black, white, navy, and gray, and jeans. And yeah. um, again, it's one decision that I just don't care about. So I want to put my energy in the decisions that I actually care about. That is so amazing because I literally just had a talk on this and that. So this, it's it's amazing that you're talking about this because you run such an amazing company. Like you have a company that is is everywhere you know um i've i've known you for i haven't known you for years but i've known your company for years and it seems like you're everywhere and you're to be able to make those decisions you realize the importance of of the important decisions and the non-important decisions Definitely. correct and so so when you're when you're in that that routine 
that um, you got to make decisions important that are uh, in the workspace. What do you? How do you rally your team around that same concept? Like when you have, so you have an important decision to make. How are we going to create this? How are we going to create that? How do you rally your team to have that same type of mindset? So I really don't try to make my mindset the mindset. Um, it's collaborative. And I know there's a lot of research about like collaborative work environments. I really like it. Um, for me, it's, it's also the way that education is changing. It's becoming more progressive. So an example is my son, when we were looking at schools, one of the, th one of the classrooms in third grade at this really um, progressive school you walk into the classroom and it's empty because the students get to design the classroom and the students make the rules for the classroom, which is pretty progressive and cool. But if you think about it, is someone gonna follow a rule that they helped create or are they gonna follow the rule that the teacher has their day one and they weren't a part of? Mm -hmm. So I really love that mentality. So um, it's, it's really not my mindset here. It is an open environment where Everyone contributes. That's awesome. Yeah. And so, what do you what? So let's go back. Let's start. So your yeah. dad started this company. Let's talk about the history of the company. It's fifty years. Fifty years. And 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 really working with home building for fifty years. Yes. Right? So the creative and the marketing for a home building fifty years ago is completely different, obviously, than it is today. So what was your dad's start? Like, how did he decide yeah. to start marketing home building, and how did he continue to evolve uh, yeah. before you took over? Definitely. So it was very, it was actually very progressive at the time because it is very unusual for an ad agency to specialize in one category. And what he did was he found a category that he loved, real estate, where the audience and clients were not competitors of each other because they're in different locations. So he created a business model where you could take the strategy and the advertising strategy and the marketing strategy and apply it in different markets by, of course, updating it and making changes, but that didn't exist at the time. So all agencies were really, each client was a totally different type of client. Um, so when he did that, he created a very unique business model. And I, as far as I know, it was the first of its kind, which is pretty cool. So his, his love of real estate and his love of advertising, he combined them and created this, this really cool business model. And, and so I'm assuming, and, and again, I have not met your dad, um, he's, that's a one man band when he started, correct? I'm saying that he have staff and, you know, he'd start with the big, yeah. big group or he just door to door, it's, cold calling. So it's to... a funny story actually. So. Elkman Advertising is an old agency in Philadelphia, and the Elkman name in advertising is pretty well known, especially in this region. They were the agency for McDonald's. They actually helped create the Ronald McDonald House, the Shamrock Shake, um, wow. some really awesome things. And it was Elkman Advertising was in the 50s. I mean, it was literally like Mad Men. I mean, that is exactly <laughs> what it was. And my father's first job was um, as an art director there and he went in you know the nephew and he's so talented so artistic he thought he was going to take over the company so he went to his uncle and said i need to know am i the heir apparent and his uncle which anyone who knows him would understand that he said get the hell out of my office <laughs> and <laughs> and so my dad and one other person left together and they started group two wow mm -hmm. that's awesome yeah what a great story and so so you grew up in this industry. I did. And so at what point did you decide that this was going to be where you were going to make your life's calling, the platform you were going yeah. to use? So I was in college. I went to college down in Florida. I went to Florida State. And I, I knew I wanted to do something creative. I didn't quite know what. Um, when I was in high school, I actually, I only took two honors courses. I was, I'm not a very academic person. I took honors English and honors art, which is so funny because that's exactly what I do today. So it's reflective of where I ended up. Um, in college, I thought I wanted to be a writer. I thought I was gonna do public relations. And I got a job for this amazing company that specialized in hospitality marketing. And it was a husband and wife and they had PR and marketing. And it was so obvious that I was meant to be in the marketing side because all these conversations, I naturally was contributing on that side. So while I was still in college, the person I was interning for put in her notice. I still keep in touch with her today. And she left the company and they came to me and said, Here's your opportunity. 
you know these clients better than anyone. Do you want this job? So I took my a full-time job that I was totally unqualified for, <laughs> um, still in college, and I ended up, I only had two classes left, and I ended up pushing it aside. I didn't finish. I took this dream job working on four um, hotel properties, two in New York and two in Florida, started traveling, um, visiting, and it, it applies to housing as well because we're really, it's destination marketing, yeah. lifestyle marketing. And it took me years to finally go back and say, okay, I need to finish these two classes. And a lot of people don't know that, but wow. you know, I did not graduate in five, six, or seven years. It took me longer because of those two, those two classes. classes. Yep. And so what made you, at that point, you, you, stayed with, you stayed with that marketing firm for a while? So I stayed there for a little bit, and then I, I moved across country to Southern California because... Southern California. Southern California. <laughs> right. Um, and my creative director at my first agency said to me, there's one place to be. And he told me the name of this agency. And I looked it up in Southern California. And I all I wanted was to work there. And I somehow got an interview on a Saturday. And I met with some of the senior team members there. And I flat out said to them, this is where I want to be. I will work for you for a month to prove my value. No cost, no commitment. I want to prove myself. And they said, we've never done this, but you're hired <laughs> on the spot on a Saturday because I went out there and I told them I, I wasn't playing hard. You know, I said, this is where I want to be. I want to work for you. And wow. I got that job and it was, I, I still keep in touch with the owner. And um, it was a phenomenal experience because I got to really shadow the leadership team as a very junior person in advertising. Yeah. And I learned so much. So it seems to me that whole that whole story of, of making a seat at the table, there wasn't one for you when you show up to that interview. Yeah. You made one for yourself. Um, takes us takes a certain amount of courage, and do you think do you think people in general have that courage anymore to do? Because that story to me resonates. Like most people say, this is what I want, but then they they don't make they don't they don't they don't put it out in the universe. They don't even say, hey, I want to be here. You're pretty bold in saying that. Um, do you think that exists still today? Do you think that's what's starting to miss? I hope it exists. Yeah. Um, I think that you do create your own situation. So I knew I wanted to be at that agency and it really didn't matter what they paid me because I wanted that. I wanted the experience. I wanted the people. I wanted the level of creativity and I was willing to not eat to have it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I was yeah. willing to not have any money in order to do it. And I think that that um, showed them that I was serious. Yeah. This, I, was, this was how many years ago was this? More than I'd like to say. A, a while, right? 10 years <laughs> yeah, it was ago. a while ago. Yeah. And so this is Pre, I'm saying if you if you're if you listen to Gary Vaynerchuk, he tells you eat dirt, right? Eat, to do exactly what he said. Yeah. Go in. Uh, D Rock, who his film guy, worked for free for a month, yeah. and this is before this. This is prior to this. Yeah. You were you were the trailblazer. You didn't oh, even know I it. I didn't know. You didn't even know it. But that's I'm saying. I think that's the thing. If if you don't, uh, a friend of mine, Jesse Itzler, says all the time. He said if there's not a seat at the table for you, go make one at the table, and that's exactly what he's in. I think that's speaks volumes about why you're so successful today. Well, thank you. I, I do think sometimes when I interview people, it's um, for a, a position here, when you don't know where you fit in or where you want to fit in, you actually give the employer more work. Like, yeah. So when someone comes here and they say, well, I could do this, I could be in account management, I could be in media, I could be in digital, it's not my job to figure out where you fit. Yeah, you right. need to come to me and say, this is my passion, this is what I want to do, and then it, you have that spot. Yeah, because if you're not willing to fight to get into the place, right. what's the chances you're going to fight when you're actually in it? Right, and I, I, I would work till midnight some nights. And looking back, it was like this amazing experience. And nobody was making me work till midnight, but in a creative industry, you look at it as art. Like, you're never done. So yeah. it could always be better. It always could be more. So... You, when you love it, you want it to be the best that it can be. What's the, what's the, um, no, no, actually, let me, I'll get back to that question later. So, so you're, so you're a group too. I mean, you're, you're at this ad agency. How do you then come back across the country to, to Philadelphia? To yeah. So my dad was definitely starting to wind down with group two. Um, with the market shifting, Group two had downsized significantly. At one point, my dad had over 100 employees. Oh, wow. So um, the agency, to be in business for 50 years, the agency had evolved many times with how the industry evolved. 
So um, he actually had uh, open heart surgery mm-hmm. and was definitely winding down. He had moved to Florida. He was operating the business remotely. And it had gotten to the size where it essentially was a brand and it wasn't losing money, but all the money that the agency was making was going to pay salaries. Yeah. So it really was, um, it wasn't in the red, but it wasn't making money. And he essentially kept the doors open for me to be able to build it back up. And so he called me and said, if, if this is something you want, it's now, yeah. do you want it? And so I came into the housing industry at the absolute worst time that you could come in. I came in at the bottom. Builders yeah. were going out of business, but it was the, an amazing experience to look back on because I've seen what it can be. Yeah, right. Yeah, you had no ex- I started the home building right when the bottom dropped out of the market. I yeah. never never sold a home, didn't sell anything, didn't know. Same thing. And, but, and everybody else was saying, you know, the market's horrible. And I, and, I, and I was a sales professional and I was like, this is the greatest thing in the world. Right. Because I didn't know, my ignorance was my greatest success. I, it was my greatest helper because I didn't, right. I didn't have any expectations. I just knew what I wanted to do. Right. And so, is that same, like you just knew what you wanted to, it to become you or know, did you find it along the way? I, I, I knew what I, I had goals and I knew what I wanted to do. I had no idea the industry would be so recept- receptive to me. Um, I also, I really started with a social media platform. So I, you know, that evolved as I learned more about housing. Um, for me, it was more, it, it evolved very organically. So I kind of looked at Group 2 as in many ways a startup for me as the second generation because everything was shifting and how people communicate. The housing market was bad, so I had an opportunity to bring something new so that we could keep the agency going. So the very first thing I did was I created a business plan within Group 2 that was a social media marketing plan that cost nothing. Mm. And I that was my very first product and I, it was either gonna fail or succeed. I presented it to my dad and he was like, I don't even know what this is. Like, <laughs> I don't even know what you're talking about. I pitched it to the industry and I had 50 builders sign up immediately. Wow. And I started, you know, my first talks that I gave were about social media. Now I have an entire social media department. I could never do what they do because when I did it, there were no business pages. There were no ads. I mean, this was profiles, using profiles to connect with people. So um, in many ways, I look at it as a startup that had an existing brand and history. Um, The other thing my dad, which you'll probably love, is my dad was an entrepreneur. So he he came up with this and put all of his effort into it. So when I first started, he really believed you have to put that sweat equity in. And he said, you're not getting paid. Make it. Build it. And there was a period of time where I really didn't make any money. And it was because he didn't. He didn't want to hand me something. He wanted me to think like an entrepreneur. Even though the original idea wasn't my idea, yeah. how am I going to take this and build it into something that actually makes money? Yeah. Wow. I love. So it was, I love that. Yeah. And so, so, what was what? You know, you're fighting a couple things. So, so, I say fighting. Your dad had done it for 30, 40 years at that right. point, right? The company is forty years old at that point, and so. Did, was there ever a point where you were where you were tempted to say, "Well, this is the way we've always done it. This is the way it's always been"? Or did you come in just breaking shit the entire time? I was breaking shit, <laughs> <laughs> and the best part was he let me. Yeah. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but there are a lot of second generation businesses where the first generation will not let go, right. and. The group two would never be where we are if my dad had stood in my way in any part of it. I mean, one of the first things I did was change our logo. Mm. That is like a dagger to the heart <laughs> of a marketing person. Yeah, right. And my dad let me do it. And, um, you know, I, I haven't made every right decision. I definitely have made some wrong decisions, but I've corrected them very quickly. But mm. had he not let me come in and do it my way, I would never be sitting here with you. That's awesome. That's just a testament to your dad, too. I I think that's yeah. very hard to do. Yeah. Well, one to hand it over, like to 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 release control and mm-hmm. relinquish control, and two 
to allow the fact that you're his daughter is another thing because listen, I have two daughters and in theory, I love what your dad did. Like, like took, Hey, listen, I'm not paying you as a father of again, 14 year old girls right now, obviously they're going to get older and more mature and smarter and wiser. But I, it would be very hard for me to, to say that to my kids and to live up to it. It'd be easy to say in theory, Hey, listen, you're not going to get paid and you got to make it or you sink or swim. It, as a father, I'm thinking, I would, I'd want to support them financially. I'd want to pay them. I'd want to do all these things, right. even though I know it's probably not in their best interest. So it's mm-hmm. got that. That really is a testament to your dad to be able to, to do that. Yeah. Um. So so all right. So keep going. So so now you now you own this business or you, you're found running this company. What was your biggest struggle at that point? So at that point, my dad had a, he had name recognition, he had personal name recognition. And I think I knew that that was not going to be the biggest fit for me, just because I do think a lot of ego came with that. Um, I I didn't want group two to be Molly Elkman in group two. I always wanted group two to be stronger. And so there was some, you know, there was some evaluating that came with that and um, I had to force myself to do things that I didn't necessarily want to do. So I do public speaking, um, not really, really not good. like you, really, but <laughs> really, really good public speaking. But for me, that isn't a lot of people who get up and speak have the ego and they love to hear themselves speak. I don't. I have this desire to teach, and for me, that's why I get up and speak mm-hmm. is because I want people to know what I've learned. Um, it's very different than what motivated my dad. So for me, you know, the outcome is still the same getting in front of, in front of potential clients, but it's a different motivation. So, you know, being okay with that, I think was always very important to me. And when I first came into the industry, I am so different from my dad that it was a little bit startling to some of the people he was working with. So, um, he is, have you ever met him? Once, briefly. Okay. So my dad is super tall, not quite as tall as you. No. Um, full head of white hair. He is a very strong personality, super confident. You know, his voice is the voice. Um, and he's funny, like super sarcastic. Like he will make a totally inappropriate joke with anyone. Yeah. Um, and and for me, when I came into the industry, he, after my very first builder show, he said, I just want to share with you, a couple people were surprised at how serious you are. (laughs) And I said, that's right, I am serious because I am technically borderline millennial, I'm a female, and I'm coming into an existing business. I'm going to have to work my ass off to earn my spot here. And to me, I take that really seriously. It doesn't mean that I can't have fun in the work, but like, I really was serious. Um, And I think even now, like, I just started to feel more comfortable talking about some things that are taboo, like religion and um, politics and even cursing. Like I wouldn't do that when I first started because I wanted to make sure I had my spot and that I there was space for me to to be in the industry. Oh yeah, that was, so that was a perfect segue because that's my next question because you are female, you are young. Um, this... I love that you call me young, you keep doing that. <laughs> Everybody's young compared to me. So you're, you're female, you're young. Um, you're, you're a business owner and you're in an industry that for, for a long time and still is today, pretty heavily male populated. You, there, listen, there's certain women that are now in the home building industry are blazing a path. You know, I think people like, uh, Molly Elkman, yourself, um, Meredith Oliver, um, Rhonda Conger. There's a lot of like, you see like more badass women starting to really, um, take over the industry. Angela McKay is another one. Like, I, I could just list like, the, but still it's very small population in comparison to the industry. Still, still a pretty good old boys club. And so what's that meant to you? What does it mean to you to be one of those people that really are blazing a new kind of a new path, a new voice? I love that. Um, So the housing industry is definitely predominantly male. The advertising, I kind of have one foot in both. I'm also in the advertising industry. Um, That's way more open and liberal and you see all different types of people. Um, The women in housing have been so receptive to me. 
So the the people that my dad had these longstanding relationships with, a lot of them gave me my first opportunities, like Lita Dirks and Mary DeWalt and um, Jane Marr and just so many people that were rooting for me. And I find that women in housing are exceptionally supportive. So that's really um, that's really amazing and has has always been appreciated by me. The other part that works on my part is that home buyers and the home buying decision is usually it starts with the female. Correct. And so to bring a different perspective to marketing, a lot of people in marketing leadership are not females. I mean, I can't even tell you how <laughs> many tables I am the only woman. I mean, I just did an event that had 10 speakers and I was the only female speaker. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about marketing and sales and you know that over 90% of the purchasing power is coming from the female, how do you not have a female at the table? It's crazy. It's bad business. Yeah, yeah it doesn't make sense. And, and nobody says it out loud, but if you take this like gut check and look around you and you're like, wait a minute, nobody is reflective of the audience we're trying to reach. Maybe we do need another perspective. Um, and I have to say, builders are open to it because any time that I verbalize that, it's, yeah, of course, we do need that. So for me, that it, even though it is a boys club, um, I do believe that builders want more women no. in the industry and they want that perspective. I agree. And so, but what is the, what is the, and I've talked, I've talked at length with, you know, I've had some pretty amazing women on this podcast. I'm married to a pretty amazing woman. And, you know, they, they, I asked the same question to all of them. That is this, this tyranny of the or, and the tyranny of the or being, I can be a great mother or I can have a career. I can be a great wife or I can run a business. Like the, for forever, it was you couldn't have both, but here you are. You're a mother, you're a wife, you're a business owner, you're a badass, you're an entrepreneur, you're a speaker. It doesn't seem like you subscribe to the or tyranny. You seems like you <laughs> have it all. Not maybe not have it all, but or or, or not or like hey, I can have anything I desire to have. I just got to figure it out. Yeah, I think the thing is you can't. You can't have everything at the top level at the exact same moment. So, you know, there is a time when I need to be home with a newborn. You know, when I had my daughter, I was not going to sacrifice that. I did come into the office. Um, I, I hate to say balance, like, because the truth is there is no balance for a working mom. It is, I believe, I will tell you, like, I think I am freaking superwoman. Because it's not easy and it's, it can be very ugly. There were tears and I'm not someone who cries easily. It's, it's not, it is not easy to do all of it. And I'm sure that's why a lot of people don't do yeah. all of it. Um, I do think that you have to accept that you're, you can't be the best at everything. So there are certain things that I have chosen to not be as great at. So, yeah. you know, I have very few close friendships, my social life, tends to be part of my business life, yeah. you know, because I have all these great relationships. Um, you know, there's that, I, I forget her name, Mark Zuckerberg's sister mm. had this whole Randy talk. Randy. Randy, yes. Mm. She had the whole talk about the five things and you can really only have three of them. Yeah. And par I find it inter interesting. So it's um, exercise, sleep, work, family, family and friendships I'm like, what am I forgetting yeah. you can only and the whole idea is that you can only really own and be exceptional at three at yeah. a time and it can change and shift so at any given point what are the two that I am okay not being exceptional at I'm never going to be okay not being an, an exceptional mom that's yeah. never going away um, I'm never going to be okay with not being an exceptional business owner because I have a team here that's relying on me. Yeah. It's being a mom in another way. I mean, yeah, right. it's my baby as well. Um, so where I suffer, and I, you don't want to know me if I don't sleep. I like, <laughs> I'm serious. I am the worst version of myself without sleep. Like that is not even close to something that I can compromise on. So where do I compromise? 
instead of exercising every day, I walk to work. And so I don't exercise as much as I should. And I don't, um, my social life, I'm like a total loser. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, but I choose to yeah. not be exceptional in those places. Yeah. But exceptional. Okay. So I, I, I'm with you on the, the I'm not going to be exceptional, but you still have a certain, I think that most people, I'm, I, listen, I, I'm a believer that you can have it all. I just, to, to your point, you can't be exceptional in all of it. But I, I, I think too many times people see this um, this road in front of them. They go, man, that's going to be a hard road if I want to have a kid and run a business. And I think there's, uh, my belief is that most, and this is not grounded in science, it's not grounded in statistics, this is my own story I've created in my head, so it could be complete bullshit. But that most, most people in this world want to work for themselves. They want they want they want autonomy over their time and their and their task, right? right? But but it takes a lot of courage to sign the check on the on the front rather than the back, right? And so people see that and they're like, "Well, gosh, the sacrifice would have to be too big." And t- to me, listen, I'm married to an entrepreneur. I'm married to a woman. the The idea is that she's owned her own business for twelve years and she's an exceptional mother. She's an ex- exceptional wife. And she figures it out. It's, yeah. you know, it seems like they just, the great ones just figure it out. Yeah, I think that it is a, a unique skill set. I definitely, I'm classroom mom. I'm not going to give that up. Yeah. But I'm, because that is a priority to me. Yeah. Um, so I do think that there's a part of figuring it out. But I, I laugh when I hear, I agree. Everyone wants to own their own business. But when you ask them why, they will say, because they want flexibility. Right. <laughs> Let me tell you, I am ne- when I tell you I am never not thinking about group two, I mean yeah. never. There is no turning it on and off. Like, it's my life. So mm-hmm. if you want to work less and you think owning your own business is going to give you the ability to work less, you are not going to succeed. I agree. Because I'm obsessed. Like, it's, I, I actually, I dream about work. I wake mm-hmm. up in the middle of the night and I send myself messages. <laughs> um, I will be shopping at the grocery store and I'll see a line that is used to talk about produce. I'm like, ooh, that, how, that's a great line. That really connected with me. And I'm always yeah. thinking of how to make it work. Yeah. So hmm. I, even though I'm, I may not physically be here, I'm always working. Yeah, so true. I've, you know, I've owned my own company now for a little, over, a little going on three years. And the idea, it's, it's, I can't even, I don't even know. I tried one point to like, roadmap blueprint this the the life the life of an entrepreneur or somebody that owns a business and i can't i can't even map it because it's i'm telling you i got a, i got an email at 10 o'clock last night and it was just an email and the way that i read the email my mind starts racing like is this customer upset are they not upset are they happy did i do something wrong oh my gosh what if they do something if i did something wrong and now they're not happy and if i lost this client oh my goodness what would happen if i lost this client then i'd have to replace this client and immediately it's like 11 30 i was like an hour of me creating scenarios and stories in my right. head whereas if i'm i never had that problem when i worked for somebody else i never right. Like, again, I didn't want to lose a client. I want to lose, you it's know, a different but level. it's an entirely different level of stress where you, you don't, you may not have a boss that signs a check, but now you have 50 bosses. Every one of your clients is a boss. Right? Every one of you, we work for everybody else. Yeah. So it's not as easy, but I think it's, I think most people want it. They just don't know the sacrifices they'll have to make. Yeah, I think, I, but I do believe it's beyond that. I think they want it, but I don't think they want it for the reasons, right, for the right reasons. that are right. Yeah. Because so it's, what are not, the right it's not glamorous. <laughs> it is not getting to work less. Yeah, no. It really isn't. So what are the right reasons then? I think like having something that you know you are good at, something that you can provide value to someone else. Yeah. So I think, you know, that that to me, it has to be about what it is you're doing. Yeah. So I love that. Yeah, I'm, I I think a lot of it for me, and I've said this a lot of times. I th- I think I might even mentioned it in the talk that you heard me speak at. But I think everybody in this world has a platform. Everybody, everybody has a platform, and no one platform is more important than another. I think people diminish the the 
important to their platform. Let me give you an example. So, so I parked across the street and the parking garage is under, coming here today, parking garage is under construction. And as I was, and I'm running late for this meeting, which I can't stand being late, but I'm <laughs> running late, right? And so I go up to this parking garage and it's under construction and, and every spot is full. So I get to the top and now you gotta start winding your way down to the bottom. So as I come around this really tight corner, there's a, a guy up on the floor, up on the whatever floor of this parking garage. And he's, he t tells me, he works there and he tells me, he puts a hand up for me to stop. And he tells me to park up against the railing. Now there's not a parking spot there, but clearly the guy knows what he's doing. So he's directing me where, where to park. And so I, I park there and I get out. I said, hey, I really appreciate it. I was running late for this meeting. I appreciate you making the space for me. He said, well, I just really hope you have a good day. I'm glad I was able to find parking for you. Aww. Now, in that, in that realm, that seems really nice and that seems hospitable and p good people are everywhere. But for me, that, that gentleman has a platform his platform is working in that parking garage. He contributed to the betterment of my life today. And he understood that platform. He understands that. Either, maybe not on a conscious level, but an unconscious level. And his platform is no more important than my platform sitting here doing this podcast. Or me. There's, so it's people diminish the size of their platform. They're chasing new platforms. Like, oh, I, well, I have to be a speaker in front of 10,000 people. I have to be a business owner. I have to, when really what you have to do is find something that gives you fulfillment and understand that's what you're here to do. They like, have this platform and how can you master that? Like, I love it. That, does that make sense? Totally. I think so. They're chasing this certain thing. My platform as a speaker, as a business owner is my platform, but it's no more important than that parking garage attendance. And I think that's where people miss it. Like I got to search the next bigger platform and that's just does, I don't subscribe to that. I totally agree with yeah. you. Um, for me, I definitely have, you know, there are other areas that I could get into with business and I have purposely not because it isn't, it isn't where I, where I succeed or where I, my interests are. So I think, you know, a lot of people who do want to own their own business, part of the failure is that it's not focused enough. So uh -huh. it, it is not the one thing or the one way that they can help. It is too broad or too scattered. And you do have to focus on that oh, yeah. specific platform. I, I would like that story. Yeah, that's great. All right. So, so, so now you, now you run in the company, you, you work with your husband, you're trailblazing. One of the things that I've found out about you in research, obviously I've heard your name for years being in the chat, never knew who you were. I knew who group two was. Um, but I never met you. But one thing that everybody I talk to. Oh, I'm scared. <laughs> everybody I talk to. It doesn't matter who I speak to. And I say, and I, this is how I'll start the conversation. I'm doing research for the podcast after I met you. I, I would call people that I know in the industry. I'd say, I just want to mention a name to you. And, and I wanted to get your thoughts. That's it. That was the whole thing. I'd say Molly Alkman. And every single one of them. And I'm, I'm talking probably more than 20 or 30 people I called or asked about you. Every one of them said the same thing. She's the one to know. Aw. She's the one to know. That's so nice. So, so what, what I'm realizing is that you're a great sphere of influence and a connector. Is that on by design or is that? No, I didn't think you were going to say that. <laughs> I, <laughs> thought you you gonna, I, gonna say? I thought you were going to say that I'm nice, which, I, which is a, yeah. would be a compliment to yeah, me. Yeah. Um, I do... I care a lot about this industry and I care about the people I've met in the industry. So, um, you know, I really appreciate that. There is, there is no design, there's no business design with that. It, it is genuine. Just authentic. Yeah, I think there are certain people in the industry that I really connect with naturally and I have these friendships that are, because it is my social outlet, is it's within the industry and some people I don't necessarily have that immediate connection with. And I don't try to fake it or force it. I focus on the connections that happen organically. What's next, for, and not for Group 2, but for the industry? What Where do you see um, both both marketing, I was gonna say housing both marketing and housing? Where do you see that going? You, know, you said earlier you have a staff of social media people now that because it's, I'm assuming because it's constantly evolving and it's constantly changing. Where do you see marketing and PR going and where do you see the home building industry going? Yeah, I think both are, are changing at a faster rate than ever before. 
So, you know, I always laugh when people declare themselves an expert of anything. I think it's the funniest thing because <laughs> how is that even humanly possible to be an expert in any category or any subject? Self-proclaimed. Yeah. But even we use it so widely in the industry, an expert, a guru, and it's like, that is horrible. Yeah. Um, things are changing so fast. I started, like I said before, I started talking about social media in the industry and now I couldn't even have a conversation about social media because for me, it, the day to day and all of the intricate details is just not what I'm doing every day. So I think, it's, I think it's changing at a very rapid pace because the way people consume information is changing and the access to information is evolving so quickly. So, you know, I love to study people. It is by far my passion. I read books on the bestseller list because I want to know what people like. I had no interest in watching Game of Thrones, but I watched it because there's such a cult following and people love it and it's resonating with people. So I wanted to watch it and of course I enjoyed it, but I wouldn't have watched it if it didn't have the following from people mm. the way that it did. So that's always been this fascination that I have. So I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> Wherever you're going, it's really good. Um, yeah, so really just, um, you know, the way people, oh, so I was gonna, this is what I was gonna say. So I study um, the different generations and what makes people the way they are. And there are so many things, but gener being born in the time that you were born influences your entire life. 100%. So whatever's going on in the economy, the way your parents grew up and how they parent you, all of it affects you. And millennials and boomers have always had this weird thing because they're just so vastly different. But really millennials are a product of boomers and how everything, how we overcorrect what our parents have done. Yeah. Um, we swing the pendulum to the other totally side. Totally to the other side. So, you know, Gen X, they were the latchkey kids. They were, you went home and nobody was home. You let yourself in the door and watch TV and ate cereal for dinner. And you may or not, you may or may not see your parents. They were also the first generation of really divorce at the rate. Um, so what did they do? They overcompensated and became helicopter parents. And <laughs> they created an entire generation where everything is about the family unit and that family experience. And there's some good to that, but it's in some ways it's an overcorrection. Yeah. So um, for me, I think when I think about housing and I think about marketing, it is what is this next generation going to bring in? Mm. And Gen X, we're already studying Gen X. I'm sorry, Gen X, Gen Z which um, my son is, is in Gen Z, and they are showing that Gen Z doesn't want to come to a website and have to make a decision. Gen Z wants you to know what they want when they come to the website. Yeah. We have now have um, personalized the consumer experience so much that those digital ads and everything you do online and all that tracking that baby boomers are creeped out about. It's like so big brother, even Gen X is creeped out about it. I don't want them listening to me through my phone, you know, covering, I have my a little sticker over my camera. I mean, we don't like it, but Gen Z loves it and yeah. they expect it. So that's gonna shift housing, it's gonna shift marketing because now we have to be tracking people online to be able to tell them what they want when they come to your site. So based on their, shopping behavior online, we eventually as an industry will be able to direct them to the home that they want or need and the community that they would want without them actually doing anything on our site. Which makes it so much faster, so much yeah, more efficient, right? It's really evolving. Yeah, I love that. I'm a, I'm a big, I don't have the sticker of my, my, my thing, I could care less. Like I'm like, Alexa can listen to me all day. Like, Alexa it, totally listens. Yeah, there's no doubt. Totally There's listens. No doubt. I get ads listens. for things that I would never <laughs> ever get ads for. I actually one time I was um, talking to my son about pizza pockets. I literally said pizza pockets, which who says that? Right. Right. Like I was. I don't know if I've ever, ever even right. heard of pizza pockets. Yes, and and then that night I went upstairs and I opened my Instagram and I had an ad for Hot Pockets, which is the brand name for a pizza, pizza pocket. pocket. What's the chances? There's no chance. They were listening. They were listening, right? <laughs> totally. It doesn't creep me out, though. I don't, like, it doesn't bother. I, I, I'm, I, listen, I'm, again, much older than you. I think I'm Gen 
Gen Gen X. Yeah. I'm Gen X. And it doesn't bother me. It bothers my wife. It bothers it doesn't bother my kids. My kids are kids my are kids are fourteen. It. They they could care less. Well, yeah. if it makes your life easier. Yeah. Because these ads are more relevant to you and what you care about then yeah. I'm not do, I, like, I'm like I don't care you can track me I'm not doing anything I'm not I'm going anywhere like I'm like whatever you want knock yourself out yeah. so so what is it so let me ask you a question so let's I want to shift a couple I want to shift a little bit so so as as a mom as a mom of two two is that right mm-hmm. so a newborn I have a seven year old and a two year old seven year old and a two year old right Seven year old, two year old. That's a big gap there. Like I, I have twins, and I'm, I'm like, I don't know how people with kids of different ages yeah. even possibly yeah, operate. I think having twins is that is like the hardest thing in the world oh, no. to have two infants at the same time. Oh my gosh! Uh, so easy now though, because they just they keep each other company. Yeah. Like they're like my oh, son's a huge help. Uh, it's, yeah, of yeah, the seven huge two year old. So, so, so you were talking earlier about you know you live in this routine. You know you do these routines with your kids. What what is what do you think your kids are gonna grow up? The, the idea of you know are they gonna grow up because you're in these routines and how strong is that programming you're making on them and is that is that is that good? Yeah, I you know that, that kind of brings up the nature versus nurture yeah. idea, and I have to tell you, I don't know how influenced they are from it. I think that they see a foundation of behavior. You know, yeah. I don't talk bad about people. I don't. The way I speak, the way, you know, just basic manners, I think, are learnable and teachable. Mm. But I think people are fundamentally who they are. So my kid is, my son, who's seven, is so different from me. I mean, unbelievably different. And I think you'll find this kind of interesting. I, I never talk about this, but I was actually a bully growing up. You were? I was a mean kid. What? I know. And at you're some, like you're like a you're like a 35 year old Mary Poppins right it's, now. No, like I was an actual <laughs> mean girl. I won't even tell you like some of the things that I did, but I think my son is the opposite of that. Like he is just good. He is all good. And my friends from growing up think it's the funniest thing because he is so different than I was as a child. I mean, I taught all the kids curse words. Like I was terrible. <laughs> and. My son just doesn't have it in him. I mean, he ha- he knows some curse words and he, he won't even say them out loud. Or oh, yeah. He just right. is all good. So I do believe that um, we can, some things are teachable, but right. I do believe a lot of it is is who you are. But, but when did, so when did, when did you go from mean girl to Mary oh, Poppins? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You yeah. can't just say I was a mean girl I'm and now all of a sudden now. You're, um, you're, you're pretty, you're pretty. Happy go lucky again. I, I from what I know, you have met you once yeah. before this, but research nobody ever, and all the research nobody ever said mean girl. Yeah, no, and people in the industry would never. Yeah. I think most people would be surprised to hear that. Yeah, um, my friends from growing up, they will tell you stories for days, but um, it really so people, and it's actually part of why I think I'm good at what I do. I'm I'm pretty empathetic, and I think it's because. People are the way they are for reasons, and they're usually environmental and what's going on around them. And I think I have an extremely high tolerance for extreme personalities because of that. Um, At some point, I realized that it feels better to be nice, and it feels better to give and be so, and to not participate in, you know competition or you know and at some point you become um aware that you have a choice and I think for me when I was a mean girl it was more of like a defense mechanism as a kid to deal with all these things going on I don't think I was I don't think people are mean at their core I think they are mean because of something and it's actually cute my son someone he I he got in trouble the teacher said something and was a was mean to him in his terms and I said you know honey that's okay and he said yeah someone was probably mean to him and I was just it was so that's sweet awesome. and I and I do think that um you know yeah I think it feels better to to treat people nicely. yeah of course yeah I, I think it's I, again I I've seen transformation in my life I see you know um uh, Roger Federer the greatest story ever about Roger Federer he was the biggest jackass in the world. He was the rudest, most pompous, right. arrogant person in the world. He gets a coach. A, a, he hired a new coach, and this is before he was the greatest golf, greatest tennis player in the world. And 
his coach was killed in a car accident. Oh. And he... I never like, knew that. He had this huge shift. And he realized he had been, like, it was such a defining moment in his life. He realized he had been really an asshole to so many people for so long. Yeah. And now he's one of the, it, it, on tour, he's ranked as, like, one of the nicest players. He's one, one of the most charitable players. Yeah. Um, and it's amazing that people can just... And that's what that's what's amazing to me is that how many times do you think people are... They, they become a certain way because of an effect. But then they've typecast themselves as that person. And not realizing that they can make a change and switch and change right. their self-view. It's hard. It's, we talked about this in my talk, the self-view, or the power of the self-view, but you have the ability to change that self-view whenever you want, right? Yeah. I 100% believe in that. And I I don't know that I can pinpoint a specific, um, you know, life event that, yeah. that triggered the change. I think there probably are a series of things, but... I think everyone is in control of that, and I think it feels better to, we all have a past, everyone's made mistakes in their life, but it feels better to bring your best version of yourself to the yeah. table. Yeah. Um, my two-year-old, I joke because I was talking about my son and just how he's all good. Well, my two-year-old is fully me. <laughs> I mean, she has got this like sassy little attitude, but I, after your talk, instead of when I talk about her, I don't say that. Yeah. I say, she, Zoe is really kind. That's and awesome. Zoe really knows what she likes. And I try to kind of reframe it just because I don't want her to identify as a sassy little yeah. dictator, which right. she we, kind of is. Right. But then, but then she becomes, then she right. believes that's right. what her view, her, your self view, right. your view becomes her self view. Right. And her, her world is so defined. So I, I believe you can, you can totally change that at any point. So you have a you have a pretty amazing group of people to work for you, and like great again not just if I just judged it by the people that I've met, an amazing culture, young, hip. I don't think they. I think they're so I've, much cooler. Than I, me. I think they told me <laughs> Chad don't use the word hip, so I probably just screwed up. Like hip's not a cool word there. Uh, they told me the term to use, but um, hip is not it. Um, but they're just cool, good people. Is that how important is that to your success? It's everything. So there are three things that everyone who works here um, falls into, and they care about each other, about the agency, and about who we work with. And if they, if you don't care about all three of those things, you don't work here. And it is so fundamental in how we work. Um, we're not perfect. We're people. You know, people make mistakes, but. Mm -hmm. When you make a mistake, but you genuinely care, it's different. Yeah. Um, and so that is really fundamental to our culture here. I do have to say, though, I not to be cheesy, I there was a point where they worked for me, but I really work for them now. I, I'm not trying to be like yeah. Gary Vee, because I know he <laughs> said that at one point, and when I heard... When I first heard him say that, I was like, what the heck is he talking about? And I get it now because I I have seen people grow so much and all it makes me want to do is invest more in them and see yeah. what else they can do. Yeah. And I genuinely, this team here is, they're a team of superstars. Yeah, and they're happy. They're so good at yeah. what they do because they care. Yeah, it's, and it's clear. It's, it's, it's clear. And that's a representation of you. All right, so a couple more questions. So um, what's next for Molly Elfman? So we talked about what's next for the industry, but what's next for Molly Elfman? Yeah. So um, I do have a new team member who joined um, Matt Riley as vice president. It is a very big deal for me to bring on a vice president who is going to work directly with me and continue to grow the agency and potentially offer some more services. So for group two, that's Molly Elfman and group two are the same thing because yeah. it's my life. I love it. To me, this isn't work. Um, I am also relaunching Elkman Advertising that I mentioned earlier. And we do have a website that's up and that is so that we can offer this passion and service um, lifestyle brands in any category. And outside of home building. Outside of home building. Wow. So that is um, elkmanadvertising.com and it's it's really a tribute to my great uncle, Stanley Elkman. That was his agency, and he's no longer around. But um, when he was here, I had asked him if he would be okay with me using 
our name and he was so excited about it. So, you know, it was never the right time, but I think now is the right time because we do have this team that loves what they do. And um, there are other industries that are lifestyle and destination industries that um, we can apply this skill set to. So I'm I'm really excited about that. And then really um, for me personally and my family is just enjoying these early years. You know, I am classroom mom for my son's class. It is something I will not give up. I go into his class every Tuesday and I, um, you know, this year I do writing with the class and I just got a phone call from another parent and she said yesterday she was in the classroom and the, they went around because today is the last day of second grade. Yeah. They went around the class and asked each kid, what is your favorite experience from second grade? And each kid kind of talked about different things, playing soccer and recess, of course, they all say. Yeah. And my son said, my mommy coming in every Tuesday. Like and what? He, like like what else do you need in life? Never right? Said, and he never told me this. Mom called me and told me, and I'm like, That's that awesome. didn't just make my day. Like that to me is the yeah. reward of all of it. That's yeah. That's well, the result. That's the, the result. Yeah. That's that's awesome. Yeah. So cannibal I, moment for me. I, I don't, I'm not. I'm not gonna miss out on on that time. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah. All right. Last question. So, oh, I'm sorry. Two more questions. So, I guess you. <laughs> so, one way do people find you, especially now, because, um, and how? How important? Let me ask you a question before I. Be, let me divert. So, how is it? How important when you talk about you? You've been segmented into home building forever. How important is branding? How important is is branding? One branding yourself, and branding your company. Yeah, it's everything. Um, it is your personality. Your brand is your personality. So, um, you know, when someone says, oh, yeah, they have great character, I mean, that's your brand. Who are you? What do you represent? Why do you do what you do? So I, I think branding is everything. Do you think, I, I talk about this a lot, and I would love to get somebody that actually knows what they're talking about because yeah. I say it, but I don't really yeah. know if it's true. But that your brand is... Your, your brand, you always have a brand, and the, the only the only factor is, are you controlling it or are other people Absolutely. controlling That's it? That's true. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, I, I do also believe that branding has evolved, and there was a period of time where people thought that their brand had to represent their customers, and that's not true anymore. So your brand has to be completely authentic to you, and your customers will love you for being you. And especially in home building, a lot of builders think that they're, they have to do things and look a certain way and act a certain way based on who their target audience is, and it's not true. And that has definitely evolved. So um, for me, it's, it's your personality, and people will want to work with you. You can't fake it. So people think that customers want to hear something, so they put that out there. But they have something else that is so special. And it's, it's like what you were talking about with, a, with your different platform. I mean, really figuring out what it is that makes you special and letting that be your voice is so powerful. Yeah, I love that. All right, now my second to last question is, where do people find you? So you said Mel- uh, Elkman Advertising. Yep, so there's ElkmanAdvertising.com is our um, new website that just launched. And then Group2.com. Mm-hmm. And actually, if you go to group2.com, there's a little high icon that shows up and you can click on it and that goes to me directly. So I love to hear from people. Um, I am pretty easy to reach and it's... it's And and you're on all social media, people... uh, uh, I am. I'm on social media and... Do you love... Do you like social media? Do you still love social media? You start... What's your what's your opinion on social media? I I love social media because it connects people, and I find such value in human connection. I do mm-hmm. think that it doesn't replace face to face connection. I really I am not someone who believes that technology is going to replace humans in in any industry. I really don't. I think it'll enhance the experience, but I think that. Um, you know, I have people that I wouldn't necessarily have kept in touch with that I get so. I'm so happy to see their life moments. And I always think, like, if you're connected to someone and you're not happy to see a picture of their kids, that reflects you, not them. Yeah, I mean, exactly. you should be happy for the people that you're connected with. So um, I love it. Yeah, same here. I think people's, you know, in any aspect of life, there's always a, a pro and a con. There's mm-hmm. always good and there's bad. And so there's obviously some, some downfalls to social media, some risk. There's some people may embellish people. But... but 
for me, it's what are you choosing to see? For me, I love social media for exactly the same reason. I love the connection. There's friends that I um, keep in touch with that I never would have or right. had the opportunity to. There's people that I get inspired by that I see what they're doing. I'm like, man, that's awesome. I need to go out and go for a run. Or, you know, I think there's just so many positives, but it's what you choose to see. You'll find, correct? Find what you focus on. Absolutely. All right, last, last, literally the last question this time. And that is when you are gone from this earth, gosh, 70 years now, like, God, you're so young, 70 years from now, um, what do you want your contribution to have been? Oh, I definitely want it to be, and I have no problem talking about this. Um, uh, actually, this past Valentine's Day, on Valentine's Day, my husband and I updated our wills and kissed each other and said, don't die. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what we did on Valentine's Day. No, it's very romantic. Um, but you have to think about those things, yeah. and I think it's important to plan for them. Um, I want to have helped people be their best version of themselves. And, and for me, that has been through their career and seeing, you know, there are group two is 70% female and that's not by accident. And everyone who works here knows that they have a job when they do start a family and the ones who have started a family. Mm -hmm. And there is, you know, this is a safe place to work to be yourself. And for me, I've already seen some people grow so much professionally and personal and professional growth go hand in hand. So to me, that is um, today, that's my focus is, you know, helping other people achieve that success or their definition of success. That's awesome. Listen, if you want to follow a badass woman, badass company, mm -hmm. group to advertise Molly Elfman, she's the one to know everybody <laughs> that is Molly Elfman, the one to know that's such a great tagline. Oh my god! Like everybody I would never use that. <laughs> everybody, everybody wants to be the guy. Well, it's sexist, but the guy. You know, I have a guy. You need your car done. I got a guy. You got your painter. <laughs> I got a guy. You know what I'm saying? You're literally the embodiment of that. That like, is so nice. Molly Upman is the one. That. The one to know. So you you must be connected in a lot of circles, which is awesome. So uh, thanks for all your time. Thank I appreciate you. it and. Uh, we're definitely gonna. We're not going to Greenworks to eat lunch. I'm just letting you know that. Right? I'm I'm not getting we're a going salad. Yes, yeah, so I'm not getting a salad That's while fine. I'm in Philadelphia. All right. Totally. Awesome. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks. Bye.